guys, it's Quinn here. If you appreciate my content, consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm notices me. This video will contain spoilers for the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. Part 1. The Survivors Following the Doomsday Battle, in which the Trisolaran Droplet laid waste to the entirety of humanity's space fleet, it seemed that all hope had been lost for mankind. But seven ships had escaped the solar system, fleeing the devastation of the droplet. These orphans of humanity were split into two groups. Those who would eventually call themselves Starship Earth, comprised of five ships. And across the sun, heading in nearly the opposite direction, the ships Bronze Age and Quantum. The vessel Natural Selection had fled the solar system before the battle due to the actions of Zong Bei Hai, who saw escapism as the only hope for humanity's future in the face of the looming Trisolaran threat. Four ships were sent in pursuit of Zong Bei Hai, but after the Doomsday Battle occurred, Zong Bei Hai's pursuers realized that they could never return to the solar system while the droplet reigned. Their only hope would be to join forces with Zong Bei Hai and the inhabitants of natural selection. Blue Space of the Asian Fleet, Enterprise of the Northern American Fleet, Deep Space of the Asian Fleet, Ultimate Law of the European Fleet, Deng Fan Yaksu was the last to salute him, Natural Selection of the Asian Fleet. Sir, the five stellar class warships you have preserved for humanity are all that is left of Earth's space fleet. Please accept your command. It is not lost on me as a major Star Trek fan that the North American ship is called Enterprise. Zong Bei Hai did not react when he heard the other's account of what had happened to humanity's space force. He had recognized the error in it early on. He convinces the rest of them that Earth will likely fall to the Trisolarans. The remaining five ships would solely be carrying the responsibility for the survival of mankind. Comrades, he said, sweeping his eyes over the five captains and the three layers of assembled officers and soldiers. I call you by that ancient title because I want us all to share a common will from this day forward. Each of you must understand the reality we are facing and must envision the future that we will face. Comrades, we can't go back. Indeed, there was no going back. The droplet that had destroyed the combined fleet was still in the solar system, and nine others would arrive in three years. For this small fleet, their former home was now a death trap. From the information they had received, human civilization would totally collapse even before the main Trisolaran fleet arrived. So Earth's doomsday was not far off. The five ships had to accept the responsibility of carrying civilization forward, but all they could do was fly onward and fly far. They all understand that these vessels would forever be their homes. They would not live to see their destination, wherever it may be. The novel compares the 5500 crewmen to an infant whose cord has been cut. They had cut the cord connecting them to Mother Earth and all that remained ahead was the dark, cold abyss. This was a time in history that Zhang Beihai had not been born to. He was from the Common Era, and had been cryogenically frozen. Because he was from the Common Era, and because he had correctly recognized the fault in humanity's defense strategy, the others see him as a paternal figure and gravitate towards him as a leader. Children cast aside into the endless night, needed a father most of all, and now like Dong Fan Yaksu, they found the power of that father in the person of this ancient soldier. They decided to head for the star system NH558J2. NH558J2 was approximately 18 light years away from the solar system. This meant that at their current speed it would take them about 2,000 years to reach it. They would not live to see it, but their descendants would. We will be a part of humanity forever. But we are an independent society and must rid ourselves of our psychological dependence on Earth. Now we need to choose a new name for this world of ours. We come from Earth, and we may be the sole inheritors of Earth's civilization. So let's call ourselves Starship Earth, Dong Fan Yaksu said. Excellent, Zhang Bei Hai nodded approvingly, then turned to the formation. From now on, we are each of us, 
citizens of Starship Earth, this moment might be a second starting point for human civilization. The inhabitants of Starship Earth would have to accept that they would forever be spacefarers. The sight of green Earth would be something that they would never see again. They could very well be the last seeds of humanity. Returning to Earth would only mean the destruction of the species entirely. There was hope here, and yet, somehow, humanity always carries with it a darkness, a holdover from our basest nature, brought on by evolution and the necessities of survival. Part 2. The Deadly Realization The Dark Forest Hypothesis states that due to the fact that the energy and resources of the universe are finite, cosmic civilization was therefore hostile. The situation which occurred amongst Starship Earth would come to be known as the Battle of Darkness, and it acts as a microcosm, reflecting the ideas put forth by the Dark Forest Hypothesis on a smaller scale. We've discussed these ideas, including the chain of suspicion in my video, What Makes the Forest Dark. When it came to Starship Earth, the problem came down to fuel. The exact route to NH-55 8J2 was long, and there were obstacles including at least two interstellar dust clouds. Passing through such clouds would create drag. The speed of the vessels would drop to 0.03% of the speed of light because of the dust. This problem was immense. At that speed, they would never make it to the star, even with the use of cryosleep. Starship Earth would become a tomb, drifting endlessly through space. We're still more than 10 light years away from NH-55 8J2. We'll need 60,000 years to get there. Then we'll never arrive. The ships may arrive, but the life on board won't. Even the hibernation can't be sustained for that long. If something wasn't changed, they were doomed. They would need to maintain their speed through the dust clouds, or somehow find a way to accelerate afterwards. But they simply did not have the fuel, and fusion fuel was the only source of energy aboard these vessels, used in every aspect, including life support. They would also need a significant amount of fuel stored up once they reached the system. Since its star was quite a bit smaller than the sun, they would not be able to enter orbit by relying on its gravity alone for deceleration. Large amounts of fuel would need to be expended to prevent them from simply flying right past the target system. All of the fuel on Starship Earth is basically enough for two spacecraft. But if we're careful, it's enough for just one. Fuel. 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 There was another glaring problem as well. The issue of replacement parts. This issue was less urgent than the issue of fuel, but just as problematic in the long run. NH-55J82 doesn't have a hospitable planet for settlement or establishment of industry, or even necessary resources to do so. It's just a place to refuel before heading to the next system where industry can be established to produce parts. Natural selection has only two levels of redundancy for key parts. Too few. Too few. Apart from the fusion engines, most of the key parts on Starship Earth are interoperable. Engine parts can be used after modification. If they could find a way to fit the 5,500 people onto two ships, they would have a chance to make it to the new system. But this was simply not possible. There were far too many people. The hibernation systems, let alone the life support systems, could not accommodate so many. It would be quite simply disastrous. This realization came to several people essentially simultaneously. What mattered was who would be the first to act. The deadly realization was that the only hope for humanity's survival on Starship Earth was that some of them had to die. Otherwise, they all would. Part 3. The Battle of Darkness The first to fire had been ultimate law of the European fleet. A powerful electromagnetic pulse swept the other four ships. The energy of these vibrations was instantly converted into infrasonic waves, which outside of a vacuum would instantly kill all humans preserving the vessels. The inhabitants of three other vessels were instantly killed, including Zong Bei Hai. The exact words were only a guess, because he didn't have time to finish before a powerful electromagnetic pulse arrived from three directions, 
vibrating natural selection's enormous hull like a cicada's wings. The energy in these vibrations was converted into infrasonic waves, which, like in the image, looked like a fog of blood that enveloped everything. The attack had come from Ultimate Law, which had fired 12 cloaked missiles armed with infrasonic H-bombs at the four other ships. The three missiles fired at Natural Selection, which was 200,000 kilometers away, had been launched before the others so that the ones fired at its three neighboring ships would reach their detonation points at the same time. It was never known who on Ultimate Law made the decision to fire on the other ships, and in the end, it would not matter, for Ultimate Law and its inhabitants would too meet their fate. The vessel Blue Space had been the best prepared against unexpected incidents. It, like the other three, had been hit by the infrasonic pulse, but such pulses were not deadly within a vacuum. Before the attack, Blue Space had placed all its personnel in spacesuits and turned the interior of the ship into a vacuum, a state necessary during high-speed travel. Because of this, no one on Blue Space was killed. Then, Blue Space began its own attack. Because infrasonic waves were impossible in a vacuum, no personnel were injured and the body of the ship suffered only minimal damage from the electromagnetic pulse. Right after the nuclear fireballs exploded, Blue Space began its counter-attack with lasers, the fastest response possible. It lit up Ultimate Law with five gamma-ray laser beams and burned five huge holes in its hull. Its insides quickly caught fire, and there were minor explosions causing the ship to lose all combat capability. Harsher attacks from Blue Space followed and under continuous attack by nuclear missiles and a rain of railgun fire, Ultimate Law exploded violently, leaving no survivors. In the end, only the inhabitants of Blue Space would survive. The explosion of Ultimate Law produced a large metal cloud which expanded outward from the point of the explosion. Within the cloud, Blue Space found the vessels Enterprise and Deep Space. Neither vessels showed signs of life everyone had been killed. Natural selection was about 200,000 kilometers away. The inhabitants of Blue Space collected all of the fuel from the other ships and stripped them of all useful hardware. The only hope for humanity's survival in the end had been to cannibalize itself. Part 4. The Aftermath. The Other Battle. At essentially the same time as the Battle of Darkness, the other seeds of humanity on board Bronze Age and Quantum would experience similar events. This time, it was the ship Bronze Age who acted. Bronze Age launched a sudden strike on Quantum, using the same infrasonic H-bombs to kill off all life inside its target, but preserving the target ship whole. Because the two ships had sent out only minimal information back to Earth, no one knew exactly what had taken place between them. They had both gone into intense acceleration to escape from the probe attack, but they had not decelerated like Natural Selection's pursuers had, so their remaining fuel ought to have been more than enough to return to Earth. The boundlessness of space nurtured a dark new humanity in its dark embrace. Something changed fundamentally once humanity lost its connection to its mother Earth. Something new was formed in its place, another point of evolution a kind of cruel maturation. Bronze Age accelerated away from the ruins of Quantum towards the Taurus system. Earth, of course, would ultimately endure the droplet attack. It was not the end of our planet's story. On Earth, the events in space were used by those opposed to the research of lightspeed vessels. In their opinion, space was like a funhouse mirror, distorting mankind magnifying the darkness within us. They believed that social regression was inevitable once we headed into space. After news of the deterrence era broke, Bronze Age returned to Earth. The words of one of the Bronze Age inhabitants became the slogan of those against the research of lightspeed travel. When humans are lost in space, it takes only five minutes to reach totalitarianism. The inhabitants of Bronze Age had expected praise as the only survivors of humanity's fleet, 
Instead, they were charged with crimes against humanity and prosecuted for the actions taken against their sister ship, Quantum. You are hereby informed that you have been dishonorably discharged. You are no longer members of the Solar Fleet, but the stain you have brought upon the fleet can never be erased. You will never see your loved ones again, because they have no wish to see you. Your parents are ashamed of you, and most of your spouses have long ago divorced you. Even though society has not discriminated against your children, they spent the past decade growing up in the shadow of your disgrace. They despise you. The inhabitants of Bronze Age had been lulled into returning to Earth, only to meet a devastating end. Later, they would send the vessel Gravity in pursuit of Starship Earth, in the hopes of bringing them to justice as well. But for now, the long journey seemed to await them. On the other side of the sun, Starship Earth had prepared for the voyage ahead of it, taking the parts of the other vessels and creating something new. Starship Earth was like a construction site in space now. The massive hulls of three dead ships dotted with the sparks of laser welding. If Zhang Bei Hai had still been alive, the scene would certainly have reminded him of the aircraft carrier Tang two centuries before. Blue Space had arranged pieces of the other three vessels and created a kind of monument in space, a tomb. A funeral was also held for those who had been sacrificed in the Battle of Darkness. Wearing spacesuits, the 1,273 crew members of Blue Space assembled in a floating formation at the center of the tomb. These were the remaining citizens of Starship Earth. Around them, huge pieces of spaceships towered like a ring of mountains. The gashes cut into the wreckage like enormous mountain caves. The bodies of the 4,247 victims remained within this debris, which cast its shadows over all the living as if they were a mountain valley at midnight. The only light was the iciness of the Milky Way, where it shone through the gaps between the wreckage. The weight of the sacrifice of those on the other vessels was not lost on anyone present. The tomb had a votive lamp at its center, powered by a small nuclear battery. It would burn for tens of thousands of years, moving through the darkness of space at a fraction of light speed. Eventually, it would reach NH-55J2, but by that time, Blue Space would have already moved on to its new destination 50,000 years earlier. Its dim light was like a candle in the mountain valley, casting a small halo onto a cliff of the wreckage and shining on a piece of titanium bulkhead engraved with the names of the victims. There was no epitaph. Blue Space had plenty of fuel and had all of the redundant parts they needed for replacements. They in fact had so much extra material that it was not possible to fit it all inside of the vessel. Storage components had to be attached to the hull, which completely changed the appearance of this ship from something graceful in design to something irregular and enormous. According to the book, the ship truly looked like a traveler on a long journey. Blue Space cut off all contact with the solar system. To them, Earth was already dead. Blue Space drifted further into the darkness, a seed in search of fertile ground in a vast universe. Carrying with them the entirety of human thoughts and memories, and embracing all the Earth's glory and dreams, they quietly disappeared into the eternal night. The Battle of Darkness, as I said earlier, is meant to illustrate the nature of the Dark Forest on a smaller scale. There simply are never enough resources for everyone. This would not be the end for the inhabitants of Blue Space. As I said, Earth would send the vessel Gravity in pursuit of them, along with the Trisolaran Droplet, who during the Deterrence Era appeared to align themselves with the humans of Earth. But appearances are of course deceiving and the true purpose of the droplet was to destroy both ships if deterrence failed. The droplet would have succeeded if not for the knowledge acquired by Blue Space during their time drifting through space, knowledge about the nature of the universe and the fourth dimension. I've covered these events in this video here, the terrifying mystery of the fourth dimension. Thanks for watching guys, make sure you like and subscribe for more Quinn's ideas.